it's not in my eyes. All right, whatever. I'll be blind. <laughs> Can everybody see us? Yes? No? No? Oh, you mean it's better if my face yes. is? Yeah. You, you, you get lit up. Okay. I feel like I'm on screen. Andrew would love that. Come on, move down. <laughs> Come on, move, move down some more. So, tonight we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to do a, uh, a chat with, with two very interesting entrepreneurs where normally we actually have a single person sort of get up and present, but they have so many stories between the two of them, we thought this might be an interesting format. So before we get started, I just want to introduce uh, Robert Levertan and Andrew Weinrich. So Robert uh, is a co was the co-founder of iVillage, Flues, and currently Live. He's an entrepreneur who spent his entire career building businesses based upon new applications of technology. He's launched five companies, had four successful exits, and raised more than $150 million in venture capital. Andrew Weinrich. He's a serial entrepreneur, social networking pioneer, and active uh, presence in New York and New York City's Silicon Alley for two decades. He's founded seven startups, has been awarded two patents. Within the past year, he's sold two businesses, including Xtify to IBM and uh, Meet Wanna Match. And uh, while well, he's also advising five tech startups, he's currently the co-founder and chairman of Indicative, a data, a data analytics startup and is running a really interesting program uh, for entrepreneurs, so maybe something many of you would be interested in, called Andrew's uh, Roadmaps, which is a very intensive entrepreneurial course that he puts on, and he lectures for uh, 14 hours over the course of a weekend, sharing uh, his wisdom to- He's got a lot of energy. Aspiring entrepreneurs, he does have a lot of energy. So with that, let's get started. So uh, I was gonna start in another direction, but Peter kind of set us up in the, in the funding direction. So yeah. since you guys have something like, I think, 850 years of startups between you. <laughs> um, 40. 40 years of startups, tech startups between us. They both left their walkers at the door. So. Um, how the fundraising climate has changed, how was it when you, you know, in the 90s and the early 2000s, too? You know, I know you, you, you both have been also raising capital more recently, so what have you noticed as some of the key differences there? We'll start with Robert. Okay, let's we'll start with me. So, mostly good news, some good news, some bad news. Uh, the good news is, of course, there's a lot more money out there, and wide open environment. Uh, bad news in some way is because VCs think it's so inexpensive to launch something, VCs can take the approach of just go out and launch something, you know, MVP, and then come to me and show me when you have some traction. And I think years ago, it took more money to start, which was bad, right? But VCs had to have more vision. They had to say, okay, I get it. You need $2 million to start, I'm gonna bet on it. Now they're more like, go out and start something, come to me and show me what it is. Mm. And the negative of that, the positive, of course, is there's a lot more startups and there's more money and uh, the negative is some things maybe need to be more than an MVP. You know, if you're creating a B2B app or some B2B business and New York VCs love B2B, you can probably do an MVP and go get five customers and prove it. But if you're trying to do an ambitious, earth-shattering consumer play, you might need you know, people to test that app and have a wow, this is incredible moment. And you can't waste, you, know, you can't have people just have an MVP. So anyway, it's just something to think about. Uh, you know, it may take, and we've been in New York doing tech startups for many, many years, and resisted, I, I'm sure, many calls from VCs of when are you moving to California, they don't say that anymore. But I think, some, you know, sometimes there may be bigger thinkers in different, you know, areas. I know we've got somebody in the audience for, who works with the, the Lean Startup Machine. I wonder if you might beg to differ, but Andrew, what are your thoughts on Lean versus uh, highly I mean, resourced? You know, if, you, if you're a startup and you're looking to raise less than a million dollars, which is typically what you're doing on your first round, you don't need a VC today. And that's an incredible dynamic. When, when Robert and I started, we were on planes to San Francisco once a month, every month, because there wasn't capital here. So we were flying out west looking for big dollars. And today the ecosystem has changed dramatically. There's, you think about the sources of capital, there's your friends and family, which we typically think of as dumb money, not that not in a pejorative sense that your friends and family are dumb, just that they don't add a great deal of value in building your business. And then there's smart money, but not institutional. And then there's institutional money. And I think Robert's right that it's 
very hard to come by institutional money for a first round. And it would be nice if it was there because institutional money can stand by you and can double down and can grow with you. But the great thing is, is it's actually possible, it's, it's actually relatively straightforward to raise, I would say, up to a million dollars without institutional money. And that's a, that's a phenomena that's, that is, I would say, relatively new. Uh, and yeah, it's, not, it's not just that they, the money's out there, there's entrepreneurs who've had success and there's people that want to invest. The processes, the systems, you know, I remember in 1999 doing a convertible note. <laughs> and people were like, what is that? That's absolutely amazing, they never heard of it. Now it's standard language. Yeah. And that's how you get a lot of the early money. And, and you know, the, the ecosystem has been defined, it's kind of, and there are a lot more mentors to start early, uh, to help early entrepreneurs. There's accelerators, so it's certainly. We were talking a little earlier about uh, your more recent experience fundraising and you now seem to have the ability to be a little bit more picky. I'm curious if you could talk about uh, who, who should not invest? Who, who are you turning away? Not, not who, but why are you turning some people away? What do you look for in a good investor? It's actually me or Andrew. Uh, we'll start with you again. Well, look, we're all flattered when someone wants to invest. Um, I have raised a lot of money over the years, but I'll admit I've made some mistakes because I so flattered sometimes people want to invest that I didn't really think that, you know, are we fully aligned on our vision and what we want to do? And, you know, it's all easy when people want to invest in you. It's harder when you're going through a recession, you're losing money, you need them to step up to the plate, and are you aligned? And I think uh, one of the stories that I shared with Aaron <coughs> had a company called Pando Networks, which uh, used peer-to-peer -peer protocols to help people share media files. We had 20 million users, and we were growing sometimes 30, 40,000 people a day, and it's 2007, and we were spending too much money on storage and bandwidth. And it's about a year or two before Dropbox and before AWS. And my investors were freaking out because we were too popular. <laughs> and we were spending too much money. So they said, you know, we gotta go B, B2B, and we gotta get monthly recurring revenue, and the consumer play is too risky, whatever. And I didn't realize at the time, because you're so caught up, you're you know, the CEO, until uh, after we sold the company, and we had a good exit, and one of my board members said, you know, Robert, we let you down. At that moment, and this was my independent board member, the investors at the table should have said, you got 20 million users, how much money would it take to get to 100 million users? Mm -hmm. And are we willing to put that money in? And so sometimes you need, you need to think about what your long-term dream is. And as much as those investors are interviewing you and you're flattered if you give them the right answers and they want to invest, you gotta think about interviewing them. And maybe ask them some questions like, we're in this scenario, this is happening, and are you guys prepared uh, to do what it takes? And um, you know, it's, it's a really important thing. So choose your investors. Andrew, what if you know, there's, there's a lot of early, you know, first time or second time early stage entrepreneurs in the audience? What if they feel like they can't afford to say no? I mean, it, right? It's a it's a it's a great problem to have to be able to say I'm going to pick and choose who I'm going to take my money from. But part of that I think starts from what you project, and so there are people that project, please give me money, please do this for me. This is really important. You can make my life. And that's not what you want to project. There are other people that project, I will make you money. You will be lucky to put money with me because it's a better <coughs> investment with me than you can make anywhere else. And it doesn't have to be so direct, but there's a, there's a, um, a sense to your entire pitch, a sensibility to your entire pitch. And I, I, think, I, I think what Robert says is right. It, you're looking to develop a long-term relationship with someone. You know, someone gives you money, and most of these startups take a very, very long time. And now you're really working for this person. And your entire reason for being an entrepreneur was so that you could work for yourself. And if now you're working for someone who gave you money at some point in time, 
and your feelings of unbelievable deference and gratitude at some point will transition to feeling like, is this a partnership? Are we equals? I, I one, um, one anecdote, uh, and you know, there are investors who start from the perspective of, I give you money and now it's my job to work for you. I'll open my Rolodex. I will, uh, I will help you find clients. I will help you find employees. I will help you find other investors. And then there are investors that just go silent. And then the worst of all worlds is there are those investors who don't open their Rolodex, don't go silent, but ask you for something in return for what they can do in the future. And I, I think what you need to be thinking about is what you're projecting, because the likelihood of you closing capital increases exponentially if you're projecting confidence, and you're projecting that as much as you would owe a debt of gratitude to the investor, they would owe a debt of gratitude to you. And the second thing you gotta think about is what type of relationship am I about to embark on? Let's get back to the, uh, the ability to project the opportunity as, a, as opposed to a plea. And do either of you, I'll start with you, Andrew, because I, I, I've talked to you a little bit about this before, have a methodology for uh, becoming a more effective uh, pitch person for raising capital? And do you have a style in which you use to try to, in, to, try to uh, portray your message when you're in the room? I mean, what, what I do is I, I think every good pitch breaks down into two pieces. One piece is my macro thesis about a market, and the other is about me individually. And the, the macro thesis about the market is ironically much, much more important. So it's much, much more important for me to tell you that I believe that there will be a social network, that everyone will index their relationships in a place, in one place, and you can see the people you don't know through the people you do. And it's very important for me to be able to show up at a meeting and say, you don't need to believe that I'll be successful. I just need to know whether you believe in my macro thesis. So we started a dating company and I said, we need to know that you believe that online dating will move mobile. You don't have to believe whether or not we're gonna be the winner, we just need you to believe that the revenue is gonna pour. And what I've, what I've found is, is that if people don't buy into your macro thesis, you're done. It makes no difference how well you can articulate what your idea is. It makes no difference how well you can articulate that you're gonna win. If you're winning a space that's not worth winning, no one's gonna invest anyway. And so what investors are looking for in the first instance is for, is for you to have the ability to project where are Google Glass is gonna go? Where do wearables go? What's the future of solar? They're looking to hear someone speak with expertise about a space. And when you're done talking with expertise about the space, if you've won your audience, only then, I think, do you really have a shot to talk about what you're individually gonna do in that space. Yeah, so I'm gonna add to that, which I agree with. Talk a little about passion and knowledge, and then talk a little bit about thought process. So a VC does wanna know that you've got passion and knowledge about a particular market. And, and you have to show it. Uh, you're obsessed about it, you've thought about it, whatever. But probably the most important thing, and sometimes VCs will take time in a negotiation get to know you over three months, six months, whatever, is they don't really care what decisions you make. They care and they want to understand how you make decisions. It's kind of a real interesting thing. They want to understand your thought process. And I learned this from managing board meetings over time, but I think it works when you're raising money as well. I used to think VCs showed up at board meetings and they want to know, well, you know, what decisions you have to make and let us help you make them. And then I realized they actually want you to say, you know, we looked at this problem, this is how we analyzed it, this is the decision we made, this is how we're gonna monitor the results and we'll keep you posted. And then they have questions, but as long as they understand, they don't care what decisions you make, they wanna understand how you made those decisions. So if they believe you know a market, it's a market that's gonna grow, you're passionate about it, and they can somehow get some insight into the way you're looking at that market, the way you're making decisions, and it gives them a lot of comfort that it's dynamic, but you're gonna think the process through properly. And I think that a lot of the raising money process is, well, we're gonna get to know you over several months and we're gonna see how you analyze and make decisions. So it's become somewhat uh, 
uh, understood that an entrepreneur who asks a VC to, to sign an NDA is sort of signaling a red flag that, you know, kind of game over before they even started. On the flip side of that, is there one thing that you, you know, we were talking about term sheets earlier, is there one thing that when you see an investor do that you kind of run for the hills? If you see like the other asking for a certain preference or anything, is there one signal that you, that you find? Robert, we'll start with you. Um, Unless the answer is no. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm gonna twist the question a little. So, <clears throat> after I sold the company in, in 2014 to Microsoft, I kind of spent a lot of time reconnecting with VCs and I did develop a litmus test of understanding if VCs are big thinkers or smaller thinkers. <clears throat> and the question was, I would, I would meet with VCs and I would say, you know, I'm looking for a company that maybe has a tech or a product founder that is ascending, going after a big market, and maybe needs a guy like me to help them. And a lot of VCs would naturally say to me, well, you know, company's doing well, they don't really need more help, but I've got this other company here that needs fixing. And to me, that <coughs> indicated small thinking. You know, I, I like VCs that say, you know what, we got a company in our portfolio, it's doing great, and they're going after a big market, and you know, we're thinking about this so long term that it's, you know. Now, anyway, so I, I like VCs that are not just in the present, but are thinking a little. Now, the last thing I'll say about lately talking to VCs, they're emotionally needy VCs <laughs> that get a little touchy sometimes when you're negotiating things, and that's a telltale. If, you know, if you ask a question and you see that it strikes a nerve in somebody and someone's getting a little emotional or they're insulted by it or something like that, it's probably a bad sign that, you know, you want people who kind of keep their cool uh, and can have a rational conversation with you. If you say something which might be a little off-putting or maybe different than you said before, or maybe they interpreted it in the wrong way, you want them to be able to ask you. Uh, the last thing I'll say is, get a VC who'll do the homework. One of the, the things I hate is when you present to a VC and they say, you know, I've seen 100 of these, and I don't believe in the space. That's a very different VC than someone says, you know what, I've seen 100 of these, I really want to understand what's different about your approach. And I'm willing to take a little time to do that. You'd be surprised at how many VCs don't do that. They just say, no, I don't believe in the space. And that's not a good sign. So let's talk a little bit about timing. So uh, Andrew's name is on the patent first. So I think the first social networking patent, if not the only, that eventually LinkedIn acquired. And, and I'm sure it was an interesting day for you when LinkedIn went public. You want me to tell that story? If, Sure, let's embarrass Andrew a little bit. I'm gonna embarrass Andrew a little. So Andrew sublet some office space from me for many years, uh, I don't know, last four or five years. And one day, he's walking around the office sulking. And Andrew can be very expressive. <coughs> and he's sulking, and I'm like, Andrew, what's wrong? He said, <coughs> did you see LinkedIn went public? I was like, yeah, fascinating, right? And it's doing really well. He's like, no, I'm not happy about this. What's wrong? They own my patent, my social networking patent that I developed at a company called SixDegrees.com, which Andrew had in the mid-1990s when we started our first internet companies. And Andrew had sold that patent to another company that bought his company, and that company went out of business, and LinkedIn picked it in. So the day LinkedIn went public, in their quiver, they had patents, and one of the patents was his, and he was not a happy camper. Mm -hmm. He would, wished he had some LinkedIn stock mm -hmm. for that patent. He's done. It. He's done all right, He's right? Done okay. But that's a good tee up for the idea. Of, I'm happy to get beyond the, the capital pieces, the sort of the least interesting. But timing, right? So, Andrew, you had you know, the first social network, but it didn't turn out to be Facebook. Um, Robert, you know, you worked on Flues, which potentially could have turned into something like a PayPal or Pando Networks so that could beg the question for a Box.com or, or a Dropbox. So I'm interested in your thoughts on. Uh, you know, Andrew, you talked before about the ability to sort of predict the future and where the where the ball is moving, so to speak. But you know, if you get there too early, it's problematic. Do you know that the number one thing you can do to be successful, the number one thing you can do to be successful is to stay alive for a long period of time. <laughs> now, that may sound like incredibly simplistic advice, but when you're doing startups for a long period of time, you begin to realize that things move in waves and that this idea that you are going to change the world while noble isn't really how
how it plays out for those people that make fantastic fortunes. The people that make fantastic fortunes not only execute brilliantly, but are in the right place, their surfboards pointed in the right direction when the wave comes in. And you can't predict every single wave where it's gonna come, and I'll be very specific. I'll, I'll, I'll share with you my experience with Six Degrees. We, we were the largest community site in 1999. We had millions of members. And we had much of the same functionality that you see on the social networks today, with one very big exception. There was not a photo on the site. There was not a single digital photo on the site. Why were there no photos on the site? We would receive emails all the time. And people would ask us, if I send by mail a photograph, and they didn't mean by email, they meant by US Postal Service mail a photograph. Can you scan it in, and can you associate it with my profile? And why would they ask that? Because there were no digital cameras in 1999, or there were very few. And as a result, we couldn't associate photographs with profiles. We actually talked about putting together an assembly line of 100 people. Now, it's not so simple as just scanning photos. We had actually developed a plan. What would it look like? How would we authenticate that this photo was in fact from this user, and how would we change it? It was beyond our doing. And then we wake up in 2001, 2002, and there are more camera phones then there are cameras, and they're digital, and everyone